everyone. Season two of Super Good Biz, episode three. So excited. Um, so excited to have Terry with us. Um, Terry is uh, the founder of Guide Beauty, um, a company that essentially is reinventing makeup. I was really inspired when I stumbled across the website and um, the shop and the brand. Um, it's all about developing a, a new approach to applying makeup, new types of product design, even new types of actual liquid and makeup itself, if I read correctly, Terry. So I'm so excited to have you. Please welcome Terry. And Terry, I'll allow you to uh, introduce and tell us a little bit more about Guide Beauty yourself. Thank you. And thanks so much for having me. This is like, it's amazing. You know, I love, I love the connection piece, right? Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm Terry Bryant. Uh, I'm the founder of Guide Beauty. And we are, you know, we'd like to think of ourselves as a radically inclusive brand. We're hoping to sort of expand the lens of what inclusion and representation means in the beauty industry um, on a scale that, you know, I think is, is deserving, right? And we're doing it by sort of reimagining makeup and how we apply it to make it easier for the broadest audience, you know, humanly possible. And, and that's what we're doing. Oh, I love that. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you are redefining and rethinking inclusivity? Sure. Um, I mean, it kind of starts, I don't know if I'm sort of jumping too, too far ahead or too far back, actually, but it kind of starts with my own personal story, right? Um, you know, I've been in the beauty industry for 20 blah, blah, blah years. <laughs> it's been a long time, over 25 years. And I, you know, I always knew I was going to be in makeup. I knew I wanted to be a makeup artist. Um, I was going to school for elementary and special education in Syracuse, New York. And um, I was working behind the Chanel counter and I was like, I'm moving to New York. I'm going to be a makeup artist. And I like, I had my eyes, my eye on the prize, right? So I decided I was going to run parallel paths. I was going to do makeup artistry. I was going to become an educator. I was going to help create these programs that was going to make it easier for anybody who wanted to, to be able to play apply makeup with ease and confidence. And that's what I did. I spent 20 plus years doing both between New York and LA. And I loved it. It's like just, it was just a, a great career. I can't say there was, I, you know, maybe a handful of crummy days, <laughs> but, but besides that, I really, you know, I loved it. Um, and hopefully, you know, certainly I, I can see, you can immediately see the effects of when you do makeup, right? Because you see it on the cover of the magazine when the shoot, you know, happens. And uh, when it comes to education, hopefully I helped change things. Hopefully I made it easier for people, but you know, no matter how much you do, there's one, it's one thing to understand the steps to do something and it's something very different to then execute it, right? So like you can teach me how to, you know, paint with watercolors. You can tell me what brushes to use, what colors, start here, soft stroke, now twist your wrist, whatever it is. I can follow you doesn't mean it's going to look like anything even remotely right, right, right? Like it's not, it's a, it's a form of art. Um, and so even though I was working on and my passion was helping people apply with ease and confidence, some things are harder than others and people weren't always getting it. But I it was my mission. I was on that path. Uh, about 11 years ago, there started to be this little shift in my ability. Um, I, you know, there's certainly sort of very distinct moments, one of them being on set working with a model I've worked with a number of times with a crew and the cast and like just just this was people these were people I knew it was an easy look I should have been able to knock it out in like 15 20 minutes and 45 minutes into it I could not get it done and it was weird so I used to always say like my arm and my hand were just this very direct extension of my mind's eye I would look at your face I knew exactly how I wanted to celebrate your features and then whatever you put in my hand whatever lipstick whatever brush whatever blush whatever it was I would just make it happen. And on that day, I just couldn't make it happen. There was just some disconnect. And I was like, huh, well, that's weird. Let's ignore it. <laughs> like, let's pretend that didn't happen. And over the years, those moments kept happening. And I didn't understand why I could kind of ignore it because I was also doing the education piece. So I found myself sort of pivoting my career away from onset, more towards education. But I was also going to doctors and they were telling me I was fine. They just kept saying, you're getting older and you're probably not that healthy. You probably don't drink enough water. Are you taking your vitamin B? Uh, are you getting enough sleep? How, you know, what do you eat? And I was like, oh, all right, well, all that sounds fair. I, 
don't exercise. I probably don't drink enough water and I don't think I've ever had a vitamin in my life. So sure, we'll go with that. Uh, but eventually about six years ago, that little disconnect that was making it hard for me to put makeup on other people started to shift my skill set enough that I was having trouble putting my own makeup on. And at that point I thought, well, this is nuts. Like this can't be not enough vitamin B, right? <laughs> like, yeah. There's something is clearly wrong. And fortunately through the right path and meeting the right people, I ended up getting to a neurologist who very quickly diagnosed me with Parkinson's. And that was the disconnect. Parkinson's was affecting my ability, my dexterity, my grip, my hand. It was the creating a disconnect between what I saw, what I wanted to achieve and my ability for my hand to actually make it happen. And so the day I found out was kind of the day that Guide Beauty was born. Mm -hmm. Because I remember sitting in the room, my dad's a retired physician, he was with me and they came in, they gave me the diagnosis. And I, at that point I kind of knew it was coming a little bit. And when they left the room, my dad said, you know, sweetie, you kind of look like you blanked out there for a minute. Like, are you, are you okay? Where did your head go? And I, I'm sure it went into a million places, but um, you know, I was thinking through if this is gonna progress, let's assume it's going to, it's Parkinson's, that's what it is, it's a progressive disease. Um, how am I going to hold on to what I love? How am I gonna to continue to be able to present myself to the world in the way that I choose and own the things that I love to do? So I went through, well, I could get my hair. And these are sort of, I know they sound sort of material, sort of trivial, but they matter to me, right? Like I could get my hair blown out once a week, done. I could, uh, calf jams, cocktail rings, fabulous outfit for my life in Palm Springs when I moved there. And that's an easy one. I can get in and out of that fine. So, all right, check, makeup. Well, now that's a daily moment. And now we're not just talking about like my makeup, we're talking about my livelihood, my creative outlet, um, my, my community, my greatest friend, like I'm not willing to let that go, but there was something kind of empowering in that moment, which is I finally, after all these years have been told there's a reason this is happening. So if I understand the reason, maybe I could find the solve. So I ran home, started pulling about part, every, every sort of piece of product I had, I had like a toolkit from like my husband. I like, I, it was ridiculous. I was just pulling apart everything because I understand the mechanics of makeup artistry, right? So I thought, well, if I understand the mechanics, maybe I can just sort of, you know, sort of rig it and make it work. And at some point I had created a prototype. It was, um, it almost looked like a, a finger puppet. Mm -hmm. and, for, and it had that little, have you ever seen the little ball, the mascara balls? I don't think so. They're like, instead of wands. Like oh, the, yes. Yeah. That the tip is a, is like, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I like, I, and I was resting against my cheek and I was the kind of, cause my hand was super shaky that day and I was resting it and I was blinking into it and I was catching every single lash. And I looked at my husband and I said, look what I'm doing. Look what I'm doing. Look what I'm doing. Look at this. This is really easy. And then I said, actually, this would have been amazing if I had had this for every client to ever sat in my chair and said, makeup isn't easy for me. Mm -hmm. And that was like kind of that aha, wait a minute, this now just out of clearly not the best news in the world maybe something beautiful is born. Maybe this is beyond me. What if I can reimagine makeup and how we apply it because of my experience and because of now this new lens that I can see it through, not just to make it easier for me, but for every person who ever said, I can't, I don't have confidence, I wish I could. What if it becomes about all of us? And that was the path I went down and it was years and it was human factors designers and it was universal design. Um, but that became the mission. And then, you know, there's something sort of, yeah, again, very empowering and, and beautiful. And it kind of, it's hard to be angry or upset at the diagnosis because it brought me to a place I could never have come to without it, you know? Yeah, that's so beautiful. I kind of got, I got chills <laughs> just from, yeah. you know, receiving news like that, that is challenging, you know, your creative outlet, but also like your identity, like what you've known for so long in your career and to be able to, to pivot and say, actually, there's a way this can be done and it doesn't just benefit me, it can benefit many people, other people who have Parkinson's, other people who maybe just have a, a you know, a hard time with dexterity and, right. and, you know, it, it can help everyone. And I, I love that philosophy. And I actually want to ask you about that. You had mentioned universal design. 
And so I'd love to dig into that. I'm also like brand strategist, innovation person in my day job. So I'm like a super geek about it. But I think, <laughs> I think it's also helpful for viewers to understand these, this concept as well. And I think I know what this is about, but I want to get your point of view and understand how, how you all approached it. So, yeah. Universal design sort of at its core, I think is, uh, the way I would define it is, uh, I, it's based on an understanding that when you cast the widest net possible, when you factor in for those who have the greatest need, you will create a better product, a better process for the whole. That's universal design. I feel like my path kind of took me down a inclusive design process first. And then from inclusive design, we kind of built out to universal design. And the result of universal design is 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 inclusion mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's it's accessibility right accessibility is an outcome of good thoughtful inclusive design and and to me that's what universal design really is and yeah. so we, we spent two and a half years we had over 200 test users wow we asked people to come in and and it's really very cool because you, you know it was come in if you have parkinson's come in if you have ms come in if you have arthritis come in if you are you know 13 and you just want to learn how to apply makeup. If you're a makeup pro, if you're a makeup novice, if you are, I'm pretty good with makeup, but I don't have a lot of time. Basically, do you want to play with makeup? Come on in. Right. <laughs> and then sit down and let's watch you. So we asked everybody to play with traditional tools and traditional makeup. And the process of let's watch and let's wait until we see a sticking point. All right, here's the sticking point. Why is that challenging? How can I solve for that? And so it's highly iterative. And because you are casting that wide net, you're figuring out how to make it easier across all those skill sets, all those abilities, all those needs. And that's how, again, ultimately you come to that better product and that better process, right? And there's so many great examples of universal design that we touch every single day. We don't even know it, right? Like it's just a better, just a better way. Yeah. Do you have any examples of um, products or experiences that Absolutely. incorporate universal design. Yeah, tell us a few yeah. so we can start to like see the world from that perspective and understand yeah. that story of inclusivity and in, in thinking about universal design and how we experience products and how that does create this positive impact and also a, a better experience for all people. I think, you know, one of the sort of the most, I mean, I think the one we all can sort of relate to is, you know, you're in New York City, you're walking down the street, it's time to cross the street. Mm. What happens to the sidewalk? It mm. starts to slow, right? This is the one that I was familiar with too, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Just the one people, I think people know. So that sloping sidewalk was only invented, this is how universal, like inclusive design to universal design starts, right? Like it only came about because somebody recognized that somebody else could not cross the street any other way. So if you were in a wheelchair and that doesn't slow, how do you cross the street? Mm -hmm. So now that sort of that design moment that element that makes something accessible that uh, to somebody who could not cross the street any other way made my life in new york so much easier i could cross the street easily especially in those days i was younger i had a lot more energy but i was a makeup artist carrying a kit a makeup kit mm -hmm. on wheels if i didn't have that slope you know, when I was traveling with my luggage, crossing the street would have been a nightmare. When you watch moms and dads and, and sitters and whoever with their kids and, and you know, and strollers crossing the street, it's just a better design. But things like the remote control for your TV, that, old, that design only came to be because we were designed for people who couldn't physically get up and cross a room to turn the TV off and on, to oh turn my the gosh. Panel, to turn the volume. If I got a TV set tomorrow and it didn't come with a remote, I'd be like, ah, oh, it's broken. <laughs> I, is there a button? Like, I wouldn't even know where to begin, right? Like, it's become part of our culture. We all use it, we all expect it. Mm -hmm. But it only was designed because we factored in for somebody who had a greater need and then we all benefited mm -hmm. as a result. The straw, the bendable straw, audiobooks, um, the self-driving car. Wow. Um, I mean, the uh, if OXO, the, the that very lovely sort of handles in the kitchen on those kitchen tools, all of those things that we touch, even the typewriter, even just the fact that we uh, are able to use computers, uh, started from and the typewriter started because um, 
oh, I wish I could remember his name, but it's falling out of my head right now. But it's basically based on a love story between um, a Contessa and her love and um, she was blind and he didn't want her aides to be able to read the love letters she was sending back and forth. I just, you let me go there. I just went. No, there. that was great. I, I <laughs> love, get excited. yeah, I love the examples. I think that really helps ground us in what that looks like and, and like how the designs, the, how universal design and products like that can actually come to life and change the world, like how they yeah. can change what we expect. So what were some of the respondents or, or the folks, or maybe you did testing after you built some products. So like, or just like out in the world now, like what's been some of the feedback? Like, what are some of the stories of people responding to these products? And I know one of them is the, the brow moment where it's the, the brow gel. And then another one was the guide wand. That was the one that I was looking at that helps you kind of have an accurate line. But I, I'm sure there's quite a few of them. Those are the ones just to help give folks who are listening, like the types of products that you have. But I, we'd lo I'd love to hear some of the responses that, that really kind of hit home for you. With Universal Design, you are having your community build your product along with you. So we already knew in a lot of ways once we launched that our community was with us, that they were excited, that they were engaged, that you know they were encouraged because you know certainly I appreciate accommodation. I don't long for it. I long for inclusion, right? I long for being thought of, being part of like, I don't want an us and them moment. I want a we moment. Um, and so, you know, when I set out to do this, I knew I wanted to make makeup artistry easier for everybody. I knew I wanted to, to just sort of say, the door is open. If you want to come play, come play. We are, we are thinking of you. We want to make this easy for the broadest audience possible. We want to make it inclusive. We want to make it universal. And then, you know, because you can't account for everybody. Then if we need to make some accommodations because you still can't, then we'll do that too, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I thought people would be excited. I thought they would find it joyful. I didn't know that as many people, it meant as much to as many people as it has meant to me. So when people send a note or a letter and take the time to do that, which is also really very kind and, and, and just a lovely thing to do, but to say not just, thank you because I can now do something either I thought I never could or I once could and no longer can, but then to follow it with, and that builds me up, that makes me feel whole. That reminds me that I am not different or less than, but I'm thought of, I'm important, I matter. Um, you know, those kinds, of, those kinds of messages, I mean, how can you not want to mm. just keep going until the end of time, right? Yeah, like, the, the way I was thinking about it before when you first introduced Guide Beauty and you're kind of talking about the mission of inclusivity and accessibility, I was thinking like, well, that's really important in, in the beauty and the makeup space. It's about self-expression. And, yeah. and I believe you said it when we first started, or maybe it was before we started recording, but it was, you know, like, I want to present myself the way I want to present myself. Like, I want to be able to wear my hair, do my makeup and, and express myself in that way. And that being accessible to everybody is important because that's like the way you want to express your identity. Even if that changes from day to day, that's, you know, like you should yeah. be able to have the ability to do that, but then taking it to a level deeper, almost on an emotional level of people being seen and respected. And like you said, it's not an accommodation, it's inclusivity. Like we're a part of this together. And yeah. that is, that is so impactful. Right, because I think, I think I see so often, and, I, and I'm victim to this too, I, I do that. Like, you know, I'd like to try to remind myself that, you know, everybody's situation is different. You know, I have Parkinson's and sometimes physically that is disabling. So I, I'll own that, right? But I don't want to own that when it comes to the, the, the objects I interact with. It kind of comes down to like, what is disability? And, and words matter. And we shouldn't remove these words from our vocabulary because they are important. It's just what's the narrative around them? Mm -hmm. how, do we, you know, right? how do we define them? And so, you know, when it comes to picking up, you know, like I think one of the first things somebody wrote is, and, and with all good intention, right? Disabled makeup artist creates a product for. Mm. And I thought, oh, I never thought of myself as a disabled makeup artist. I'm okay. With having a disability, right? Like I don't mind the word, 
but I think what it what it clicked for me is that makes me own it, right? Mm. Like physically things are disabling, but disability can be seen. And there's a whole redefinition in the World Health Organization about um, at least from a medical to a societal model, right? Which is what is disability really? Is it a physical or cognitive difference in a human being, or is it a disconnect between any given human being's, you know, uh, skill, ability, uh, and the objects they're interacting with. And if it's that, then when I pick up my eyeliner, if I can't use it, the eyeliner is disabling, right? Because mm-hmm. I'm not a disabled makeup artist when I put my, wand, my guide wand in my hand, right? So mm-hmm. I, think, I think it's just important. I think both are important to consider. There should be a societal model and there should be a medical model, right? Mm-hmm. But when do we own it? And I think that's the heartbreak. When somebody picks something up and says, I can't do it because there's something wrong with me. Mm. What if it's just, we haven't done well enough yet. We haven't considered enough yet. We haven't cast that wider net. We haven't we just sort of widened that lens. We just haven't done enough because there's always more you can do because we're clearly not done, right? Like we, we, you need to keep going. That's what universal design is. You just need to keep building and building for better. Um, so yeah. I love that shift in, in taking away, you know, a disability being your whole identity versus yeah. it's something that you're experiencing or that you have or that a product or, you know, an experience is creating in you, like calling the the product, that object, the item disabling is such a shift in thinking. And I have not heard that yet. And that is extremely empowering to people and also empowering to, to industries to start to rethink how they are designing these products. Has What's the response been in the beauty industry? I was, you know, I was, I was tell that my, my husband laughs because I, you know, for, for three years as we were developing, I was like, this is right. I know what I'm doing. I have no questions. And then it was like two weeks before kind of the world kind of shut down a little bit, COVID sort of hit. And I'm on a plane going to New York to talk to the beauty editors, talk to the press, like have my big meetings, share what we've been working on. And we're on the plane. And it was the first time my, my husband ever heard it. And I turned to him and I said, what if they don't like us? <laughs> oh, now I'm nervous. And he said, well, then we'll just go home. You'll have makeup for the rest of your life. We'll have cocktail <laughs> hour. We'll have laugh. It'll be fine. I was like, all right, I'll go with that. Thank goodness he's such a kind human being. Because, you know, you, you do get nervous. They've seen it all. I do recognize that it's like, it's not just a shift in, in design, but it's a shift in narrative. It's a shift in mm-hmm. thinking. Will people understand it on a bigger level? Will they understand sort of the we concept that this is not, it's important that we are including and we're thinking of, but I'm not designing for us and, and, and them. I'm trying to say, let's just try to, as much as we can, right? Here's the week. Mm-hmm. What if they don't like it? And we got there and they got it. Like they just got it so quickly that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was thrilled and I was humbled and I was excited. And uh, I don't know, I don't know that I could have expected it to have gone as well as it did because that is the community, like my own community. I, that might be the, actually the part that probably, if, if you were going to get me to cry, which actually I cry a lot these days, but generally for good reasons, um, <laughs> that might be the moment because this has been my community for so long, like the makeup artist world, like these are my people and I've loved it. And I, for a long time, I was disconnected from it. I was like, without even knowing why, because for years I didn't even know I had Parkinson's, but I was like slowly shriveling away. And when I found out I had Parkinson's, I was like, well, I'll stay as long as I can, but I'll hide it. Because I always thought the minute I share, I was like, I'm done, I'm out, right? Like I no longer have space here. And so when I came back and I came back with this shift and I came back having learned and grown and, and with something new to say, you know, it were hopeful, but I don't know that I expected it to, them to be as excited and, and as open and as welcoming um, about what we were doing. And so I, and I think so for me personally, I was like, oh, all right, I, I still I still get to stay here. Like I still belong. And so personally, I was super excited. But then also there was this realization that we can do this because if they're willing to help spread the word, maybe other companies will do this. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, inclusion and representation grows in a much bigger way, right? Because the industry needs to do it as a whole. It can't just be one of us, right? Right, yeah, it has to be the new standard. Like this yeah. is how these products should be thought about and the perspective and tested. Um, 
I just like hearing, hearing the perspective around the we and the not being accommodated, but being included, respected, seen, thought of, that's been like my biggest learning from, from talking with you and, and the shift of thinking about objects as being disabling like that. There's so, there's so much in that. And I'm still learning and, and looking online and learning about different um, things going on and how businesses are iterating and pivoting and trying to make impact in different ways. And all of it is about, you know, bettering people's lives, bettering society, showing that we can do business and make things that are better um, for society, for people, for the planet, for, you know, humanity. So that's been an amazing takeaway. And I'm like leaving this conversation super inspired. And I know what people who are listening, all the, all the fans out there, like I know they'll be, um, you know, at least like walking away, reflecting and thinking about the different things that they interact with every day and, and having that new perspective. So I just want to say thank you for making time and, and dialing in and chatting with me. It's been a really lovely time to chat with you and, um, and just like hear about Guide Beauty and everything that's going on. Thank you so much. Thank you for saying that. I mean, these are the conversations that make it happen, right? It's just, it's awareness and it's just the openness to share with one another, shared experiences. And that's, that's, that's how we shift culture and society. So thank yeah. you. I really, I really appreciate it. Thank you.